Good afternoon and welcome to our webinar presented by the Chemical Coders Association International and Products Finishing Magazine. My name is Tim Pennington. I'm the editor of Products Finishing Magazine and we are pleased to bring you this webinar titled System Design Webinar Series Design a Better Finishing System Part 1. First we want to thank our sponsors for today's webinar. We want to thank Engineered Finishing Solutions, Thermotronics, and Fostoria Industries. And as a reminder we will be taking questions for our panelists uh, today. You can ask those questions uh, at the end of the presentations and they'll be happy to answer those for you. Right now I'd like to introduce our presenters for today's webinar. We're going to be, uh, be John Sudges and Bruce Bryan. I'll start with John. John has been in the finishing industry for over 20 years. He's been involved in the paint and powder coating industry for over 15 years. He is a system specialist for Midwest Finishing Systems which designs, builds, and installs industrial finishing systems. And also Bruce uh, Bryant is a Vice President of Sales and Education for CCAI. He's been in the finishing industry for over 35 years. His primary experience has been with the powder coating application equipment and recovery booths. Uh, prior to joining CCAI in February, Bruce worked four years for his Vice President of Sales for Mighty Hook. So we appreciate Mighty Hook's willingness to provide us some slides that are actually going to see in today's presentations. And with that, I'm going to turn the webinar over to John, who's going to get us started. Thank you, Tim. Uh, welcome all. Uh, today's agenda, we're going to be going over two parts uh, for this part one of this series, system design and parameters. The part I'm going to uh, take over is design data, uh, trying to co collect the proper data to design a system. And then I'll hand off and uh, give it to Bruce and he'll do the hanging considerations. With that said, we'll go right into the design data. Um, some of the things that we need to have to get, the, get this started is working on getting the maximum part size. Uh, what we'd like to do is uh, ask that question of how many widgets or how big is the widget that we're trying to produce? Does it make sense just to have one big widget or does can we put multiple widgets in the space provided? With that said, we're always looking at width, height, and length. Uh, over on the right you can see we have a window of opportunity of, of from left to right is our width and then our height. Uh, so that way the product can actually move through the process. On the lower left, we're looking at width, height, length. Again, if you're doing small components, it might make sense to fill a window of opportunity. Again, I'm ahead of my slide. This creates the window of opportunity. Substrate material. Once we know the size of the product, now we will ask the, what the substrate material is. Is it steel, cold rolled steel, or hard rolled steel? Aluminum, or some type of casting? What is the thickest material that we're going to be processing? Uh, this is critical because this information will help us design the curing capabilities whether we're talking liquid coatings or even powder coatings. We need to know what the thickest substrate is because we need to get that substrate up to temperature and hold it at temperature. What is the maximum weight of the product? Uh, the reason we ask that is for maneuverability throughout the process. Whether it's uh, automated process or whether it's a manual process we, know how, we need to know how to design the different types of material handling to, to move the product through the process. Performance requirements. Finish quality. What are we trying to achieve with the finish on the product itself? Is it indoor and interior products such as filing cabinets, office furniture, or even TV mounts. The one common area here is it's all indoors. Um, not, there's no weatherability to achieve. Or is it outdoor or exterior products? Now we have to look at UV protection from the sunlight 
and then location within the I'll say the United States if it's down in Florida we're concerned about uh, the salt uh, if it's in the Midwest or Minnesota we're, con we're concerned about the the winter months and or the plowing months you know what kind of durability are you looking for the coating itself so here's some outdoor uh, exterior products snow blowers lawn mowers rims outdoor patio furniture and pavilion structures one common thing that you see there is everything would be outdoor and would be in the sunlight so we need to provide some protection production requirements this will actually help size the the process uh, we can either get yearly production which is 260 days or we can arrive at this with monthly data or even daily data and part of daily is what we're asking is is this going to be a one shift operation or a two shift operation or 24 7 operation production requirements will dictate the process and what I mean by that is that the process is either going to be a manual process uh, based on the number of products that you want to produce daily or it could be automation process where it could be a continuous process where we use a different type of material handling to take it through the process itself what is the area available at your facility um, is this something that once we take the design data and the production requirements we can start evaluating the size of the process and the pieces of equipment required what utilities are available at your facility electrical gas water and drain which would include the wastewater Thank you, John, and thank you, Tim, for this opportunity. And uh, again, I also want to thank Mighty Hook for allowing us to uh, use the slides that will be part of this uh, presentation. So, um, one of the things I like to just touch on at the, at the skit go is appreciating the opportunity to present this information at this stage. Um, unfortunately, many times the hang methods um, or how a part is going to be hung is one of the last things that is given consideration. And numerous times um, there will be a phone call about a customer installing a new system, and uh, they realize they're going to need some hooks and racks, and you know ask them how soon they'll be starting up, and it's going to be in two weeks. Um, if if all you're looking for are standard hooks, the uh, the hook suppliers that are out there can certainly have a good stock of inventory for standard type hooks and even standard racks. However, even on a standard rack that's uh, in inventory, this section up here, which is going from your hang point, whether it's a load bar or a pendant on your conveyor, down to the top hang point where you want that located in that window of opportunity, that's going to be custom. And that's going to add to the lead time of being able to be responsive and get you the 400, 500 fixtures and crossbars and hooks that you're going to need for your system. So it's great to have the opportunity to try and present some information that I hope will be helpful to you as you're either looking to design a new system or uh, update an existing one to get better line density, better uh, throughput on your products. So what's the, the purpose of the hook? Well, first and foremost is to secure the part, the substrate. And John mentioned in a variety of different ones and we want to take into consideration the weight of those parts, the maximum weight is going to determine a lot to do with the size of hook that you have, um, how it's going to be cleaned, whether it's shot blast or pretreatment, is it going to be a dipping process or spray, and the curing. So first and foremost, we want that part to stay on the hook throughout the whole process. We want to ensure there's good ground, and that can be for a powder system, that's an absolute requirement. For a liquid electrostatic, it's a requirement from a safety standpoint, as well as from a, a situation of getting good, consistent coverage. So we want to ensure good ground. Part orientation and presentation. How does that part, how do you want that uh, hanging, going through the process for either manual application or automatic, that it is consistent on a regular basis? 
if obviously if you have a system with robotics, it has to be in the same position, very precise on a continual basis. And that means how is it presented for cleaning to get maximum cleaning on the part, the coating process, and curing, in particular if you're using infrared as part of your curing method. And then of course keep, keeping in mind how you're going to hang it as well as what areas of that part may need to be masked. And sometimes the hanging fixture can provide masking and I've got an example of that that we'll look at in a little while. Um, we'd like to be able to say we can eliminate a hook mark but you can't. We can we can do different things with the hook design to try and minimize that but where there is that contact point uh, at the time that that part finally comes off your line there will be a little bit of a tiny mark there um, but through some of the designs on the hooks themselves you can help work towards minimizing what that hook mark is. And then of course there's always standard and custom hooks, um, a wide variety that is, that is available in terms of the shapes and sizes and so forth and, and I always encourage people to initially look at what your standard options are and will they work for you. Um, that's going to be a lot easier to get them from an inventory standpoint as well as they are typically uh, more cost effective as opposed to the custom hook designs. But depending on your situation, you may not have any option but to go with a custom hook design. So here's just kind of a, a little mix of different types of hooks and styles. Um, the type of wire that's used, it's either square or round. I'm, I have seen other shapes, but typically it's square or round. And the square is actually bent on the sharp point. So it, a lot of times you might hear that referred to as diamond wire. And what that does is it gives you a very sharp edge to help improve and maintain good consistent ground um, through the coating process. Keep in mind that truly the only time that you really need to have the ground is during the coating process when you're going through the paint booth or the powder booth. Going into and even coming out of if you don't have ground that's not a critical point. So there's a, there's a reason uh, sometimes companies will look at installing a rub bar uh, above the booth to help ensure that they have good contact and good ground throughout the process. There's a lot of different type of hook styles. Um, bend radius is you know an S hook or a J hook. It's got a rounded bottom. Uh, we call a bowl is the bottom portion. So the diameter across there might be one inch, might be a half inch, might be two inches, depending on the hook material um, and the t and again the weight of the part. A V bend. Uh, allows getting the part a little further away. Down here on the bottom shows a V bend. A check mark bend is, is exactly what it sounds like. It looks just like a check mark. Um, and then there's a, a variety of uh, modified type hooks. And down here in the bottom right, where the uh, pointer is, shows some samples of ways to try and hang parts that don't necessarily have a hanging hole. So you have some panel hangers here that give you an opportunity. Um, you're definitely going to have more of a, a mark on that part there in case, but you may have a situation where you don't have a choice because you cannot put a hole on a part. Uh, one of the things that's not shown in the picture but I do want to mention is um, magnets. So there are high temperature magnets that can be used for hanging parts. Of course, that means the part's not going to get 100% covered, but you may not need that. You may only need to be coating uh, an exterior surface, and it gives you the opportunity to use um, magnets as an option. So um, I bring that up is just to try to make sure that everybody is aware of the variety of different types of options that are out there for hang methods. And then we look at uh, you know making a selection on the hook material and the size of the material and that has to do a lot with the strength of the uh, of the hook that we need for the weight of the part. What type of temperatures is it going? If it's a traditional paint or powder system you might be looking at 450 degrees, maybe a little higher. Um, if it's a porcelain operation, you're looking at uh, uh, firing temperatures of 1500 degrees, so we have to take that into consideration. Do you want to be able to perform welding on the hook because you might have two hook points or for some reason it's going to get welded to a rack? So there's different materials, some that lend themselves uh, more to welding than others do. And finally is cost consideration as well. So the typical types of materials that are used is hard drawn spring steel, it's A227, that has a very high tensile strength. It's typically used up to a quarter inch uh, round or square diamond wire, uh, but not typically not larger than that. Um, 
one of the downsides to the hard-drawn spring steel is you cannot weld it. So again, if you have a situation where you're looking to weld to a rack, uh, hard-drawn spring steel is not the selection. Hot rolled is typically used for making of custom racks. Um, not so much uh, on the hooks themselves because it, it's a softer material and it doesn't have as much good holding power. co roll steel is the majority of the hooks. Good welding, good, good strength, C1008 and 1018. 1018 has a higher tensile strength and so it can, hold, uh, it can hold more weight with all the other parameters being identical. And, and as we go down this list, uh, we go up in cost. So again, keeping that in mind. Stainless steel, typically we're using 302 or 304 spring steel. Really good tensile strength, great for welding. Holds up very well under uh, burn-off processes and cleaning. Um, but again, it has a higher cost. Um, and you know, I'll, I'll touch base on burn-off or, or cleaning of, of, of hooks, but keep in mind that anytime you're going through that burn-off process, um, typically, again, going from top to bottom here, you start to weaken the integrity of the steel and therefore weaken the integrity of the hook's ability to hold a certain weight. And then finally, there are alloys that can be used, and these, again, typically are more for porcelain type operations where we're using RA330 or Inconel. So here's an example of a hook that originally was just an S hook. So this little section here was not part of the hook and uh, this retainer here was not part of the hook. And so this was 302 spring steel stainless and it's a diamond wire so the parts would you know be on a sharp edge here to ensure good ground, good contact. Um, and this hook would go onto a crossbar and then the part would hang on here. Well this particular customer uh, has a very aggressive shot blast process as part of their cleaning and then it goes went through a eight stage washer um, and then burnt dry off, cool down, powder coat and cure. And the problem that we were having when that system was first being tested and started up is that not only were we getting parts and these are these are smaller parts, lighter parts, not only were we losing parts coming off the hook going through the shot blast, we were losing hooks coming off the crossbar. So what was done is there was a design change made in the hook to where we put another bend in here and it's, it's called a gotcha. And the purpose of that then is to make it more difficult for a part to come up and come off of that hook. And that worked extremely well to help improve keeping the parts on the hook. And then in addition, this cross par was welded onto the hook. And so actually when they put this through the hole in the crossbar, you thread it from this end and you thread it through the hole, so then it comes up and around in a nest inside the hole with the retaining bar in the back. And so it was virtually impossible for that hook to come off. So just present this as you'll see a couple of other examples that there are a lot of different ways that hooks can be created to accomplish and achieve different challenges that may be out there. This is a, uh, a situation for dryer drums. So this customer uh, had an automated system for coating the inside and outside of the dryer drums. So the bottom had to be opened to allow an applicator to rotate up into the dryer drum and apply a coating to the inside. Uh, you can make out a little bit here that these are rather sharp edges that the drum would nest in and that would help minimize the amount of hook mark that was uh, uh, remained after the part was coated. And then there was sufficient space between basically the rest of the frame itself and the exterior of the dryer drum. As it would go through the process, it would rotate and they would get good consistent coverage over the entire piece. So on the surface, it doesn't look like there is a great challenge here. Um, accomplish what the customer needs and so forth, but another portion that needs to be kept into consideration is the fact that when these come off the line, they need to be cleaned, they need to be stored, and you can see that this takes up quite a bit of footprint. So the overall rack needed to be designed to where it could collapse and fold down into a flat orientation so it could be stacked easily for storage as well as making sure it had very good density when it would go through the burn-off process. Again, I mentioned uh, we're a hanging solution. 
could also provide masking. Um, this particular piece, the customer required the entire piece to be washed going through the wash process. So this area here was exposed and would in fact get cleaned. But when it came out of the washer and before coating, they wanted that to be masked off. So here was a device designed to where an operator after would come out of the, uh, the wash system um, and dry off to where he would engage this mask masking section which would come down and block that off. So you could get the coverage that was required uh, but still have the masking that was there without going through the process of you trying to figure out some way to do that with tape or uh, a masking method. So you can accomplish masking sometimes with the design of the hanging fixture itself. So this is, uh, there's a lot of information on this slide and what we're looking at is what the weight load is of a particular hook. So the example I'm using is half inch round material, it's uh, coral steel, it's 1018, which again has a very good tensile strength. Um, the force distance, that's half of the bowl. So this is an inch and a half bowl, the inside of the S hook or J hook, and that's assuming you know that the part's going to hang there in the center. So that's your force distance is from the outside of the hook to the center point of the bowl. The safety factor we're using is two and a half. Um, just like plants today will establish weight limits for what an employee can lift. Um, you know, we know Southwest, you can't have your luggage weigh more than 50 pounds. And so they, they establish certain weights. There are plants that say, you know, our, our people cannot lift something more than 35 pounds. And so they, they determine what that is. Um, we like to see companies come up with that same information for the safety factor that they'd like to use in the design of the hooks, in particular when you're looking at, you know, hanging heavier parts and if there's elevation changes, um, you know, that they're going to be up in the air. We certainly, the last thing we want is anybody to be hurt. So um, in ASME, they don't specifically state a safety factor. One thing they do say is kind of an indirect way is they say if you're going to hold something that weighs 500 pounds, you should use something that can hold a thousand. So it sounds like two to one. Um, if uh, and, and again, other manufacturers may choose to stay with two to one, some may go to two and a half, some may go to three. Um, you really don't want to go much beyond three. It, you might say, well, why don't we just make it five to one to be really safe? The reason is that you don't want the hook to be the strongest thing going through your system. There may be times that for whatever reason, a part or something gets hung up through the wash system, etc. You don't want, you want that hook to fail. You want that part to come off. You do not want to damage your capital equipment um, in, in exchange of a hook that might cost three or four dollars. So it's a balance of safety with practicality. And typically in the range of two to three to one, is a good safety factor. So what does this information tell us on the slide? So with this, uh, with those parameters, half inch round, 1018 material, uh, one and a half inch bowl, it's going to hold just under 460 pounds. Um, and then as we go down this chart, uh, if we use diamond wire, it's now 550 pounds. So you, you can certainly hold more. However, a caution here on diamond wire. A round wire half inch round, you know, we might be going through a hole that's three quarter of an inch in size. Diamond wire, remember we're bending it on the point, so you have to factor in the hypotenuse of that. And a half inch uh, on the flat being a half inch, the hypotenuse is going to be just a little over 0.7. It's going to be 0 0.707 inches. Um, and so that's the reason it can hold more weight but then you got to make sure that that's going to go through the hole you have for hanging it. So you may end up actually, um, if diamond wire is the route you go, but you've got a limitation on the size of the hole, you might drop down to three eighths flat, and uh, and with that with that uh, hypotenuse then can easily fit through that three quarter inch round hole. So just that's a factor you need to think about if you're going to look at diamond wire, um, is that trade off of hole size to make sure things not only go on easily, but come off easily after they've gone through a coating process. As I mentioned, 1008 is a little bit of a softer. You can see it's significantly lower in its ability to uh, 
to hold weight. It's uh, you know over 100, almost 130 pounds difference. Um, a227. I mean, it's you can tell obviously it's got very very good tensile strength, but uh, you're typically not using that for something a half inch round. That's typically up to a quarter inch. Hot rolled. Now here's here's stainless steel. Um, this we can use. We can use 302, 304 for a half inch, and 850 pounds. And then the last uh, parameters that are shown here is what happens if the wire is increased or decreased by a certain percent. You can see the difference in ability to hold weight. And then here's the change in the force distance. So again, we got an inch and a half ball, 0.75, three quarters of an inch to the, uh, to the force. If you can uh, decrease that, even just by 10%, you're up over 500 pounds. So sizing that ball is important. And so the question sometimes then comes up is, well, when am I using uh, a ball versus a, a, a V base? And a bowl is typically going to be used for a part that might be an eighth inch or thicker, or you've got a couple of holes that you're going through to hold a part so that, uh, so that that can kind of nest itself in the middle, in the hang point, and that's typically when a bowl is used. The V is used more for thinner than eighth inch, you know, sheet metal, flat parts. Um, and the benefit is, is that part is always going to nest in the same place every time. So you've got a little more shielding on there, and you've got an opportunity to potentially run that hook through your process uh, maybe a few more times before you start to be concerned about losing ground. On a bull, if you're using um, flat metal, it might, it might ride a little bit off center the first time, and then the next time through, uh, it's, it's shifted now, and now you're actually hanging on a coated part or a coated area. You're going to lose ground, and that's a problem. Um, the one other mention I'm going to uh, talk about on ground is, and unfortunately I've seen this in lines before, is uh, operators that are being very diligent, and uh, as as one as they remove one part, they take the hook and they turn it upside down, and put it back on the line. And I asked them why they were doing that, and they said, well, this way we can run the hook through the line more um, before we need to burn it off. And he said, we want to make sure we have good contact between the part and the hook. And I, I kindly reminded him that he also needs to have good contact at the top end, whether it's a pendant or a, uh, a load bar, you've got to have good contact there. Every point of the process, you have to have good ground for the safety and performance characteristics. So now we know what a hook can hold, and here's um, the opportunity to look at, uh, you know, because of your process, you require some weight load testing. And uh, it could be where you're doing just a single point testing. It could be where you're testing a rack or a crossbar. Um, I mentioned the safety factor through ASME, where they indirectly sort of say two to one. Um, again, a decision for the company on where they want their safety uh, versus the uh, performance. There's three different types of ways when the testing is taking place. So there's elastic deformation, plastic deformation, and total failure. Elastic deformation is where the hook actually starts to, uh, to bend. And if you think of a light hook, how you can, you can play with it, you can flex it. But when you remove the force, it returns to its original uh, orientation, uh, its original shape. Uh, there's, there is no failure there. There is no problem as long as you're still in the elastic deformation phase. Uh, the plastic deformation is that moment in time when it goes from elastic to a point to where now when you remove the force, it does not return to its original shape. So now, in fact, it has changed its, uh, its shape, and that is plastic deformation. Total failure is where that hook completely opens up, um, and, and it's not going to be straight, but I think you can visualize what I'm talking about there. So um, typically what we would consider failure is that plastic deformation point. And, uh, what ASME does say is very specifically is that once you've determined the weight load limit for a hook, you should test it to 125% of whatever that is. So if the hook's rated uh, with your safety factor of two or two and a half, and it's rated to 100 pounds, then the testing that should take place should be to 125 pounds. So 125% of the weight load limit, that is what ASME does recommend. I do want to point out that this is Initially, this testing is being done on virgin material. So this is material that's not gone through your process. 
It has not uh, been exposed to curing temperatures. It's not gone through any kind of a burn off. Um, so it's, you know, it's going to be at its greatest strength when this initial test is done. Um, so I would recommend uh, if it's critical to you in your operation that you might want to establish with your supplier a periodic testing program to where maybe every six months you send hooks back to the manufacturer to get them weight load tested again and, and there's an electronic readout bar graph showing where you're getting that plastic deformation and you'll start to see a pattern if you start to do this over a year or so you'll see a pattern that over time these hooks will start to lose their strength and the, uh, the, the hard drawn spring seal is going to actually that's going to become more brittle um, the co roll steel is going to just become a little softer because you're driving carbon out of there and stainless steel is going to hold up and last longer but it will over time um, start to lose some of its strength if you're using a burn off process and then the question is do you need to mark these hooks if you're using chain for example um, do you need to have that marked and identified that you're using grade 63 chain which is what's recommended uh, because of the heat, the heat strength of those hook of the uh, chain is grade 63 and if you like uh, digging in deeper to this type of information I'm listing the two primary documents that are used it's ASME BTH1 and 30.20 So now I'm going to shift, uh, shift from the hanging uh, hook section into rack technology. Um, and so, you know, we'll look at, again, we'll look at situations where uh, you can either be considering standard uh, design type racks or custom racks. The hooks that are used, you know, the hooks that we've been talking about in the previous portion of this presentation uh, are basically the same. So. You know, you're still looking at stainless steel. You're still looking at hard-drawn spring steel. And if you're not welding to a rack, the hard-drawn spring steel is typically what's used on these um, modular-style racks. So one of the times that you look for, you know, maybe going from hooks into uh, racks themselves. Well, large, heavy parts is, is going to lend itself more towards a hook. Um, typically, shorter production runs in terms of the quantity of parts that John was referring to earlier. Um, if it's a complicated part, it might require uh, looking at a hook versus a rack. Uh, but but there are examples and, and situations where um, you can rack those parts as well. Uh, part rotation and uh, looking at if we're concerned about rack shielding. And then I listed on here uh, that you can daisy chain parts with hooks. It's certainly not my uh, my favorite way to do things. Um, daisy chain is basically you're coming off your hang point. You hang a part, and then you hang a hook off the bottom of the part, and then you hang another part, and then another hook, hook, part, hook, part, hook, part. Um, the biggest concern, obviously, is one is parts are going to be swinging at the very bottom, going to be moving around a lot more. But two, the more critical situation is the potential of losing ground. So, you know, every every point of contact throughout that daisy chain, you have to have good ground to make sure you're getting good performance and have safety. So typically we're starting to look at racks if we have uh, smaller medium sized parts, you've got longer production runs of those parts. Um, you might be looking at doing kitting. So you know all the parts that go in a particular uh, assembly is a kit and you want to keep those together. Uh, rack stripping, so again with a rack you need to be able to store those things and you need to be able to, uh, to burn them off so the size of those can come into consideration. Um, typically you're getting more line density with the uh, with the rack approach versus individual hooks and with that you also have the opportunity of looking you know if you've got small parts and you're going to be putting 75 80 100 parts on a rack um, you might want to be doing that offline and then just load the rack onto your conveyor line when you're going through the application process um, again a factor there is going to be weight uh, in terms of what your operators are able to lift and put on the uh, conveyor system so a dedicated rack that's going to be uh, custom designed, it's going to be same or similar parts. Again, I mentioned kitting as a situation there. It does allow uh, the supplier to really come up with a, a really good line density in the situation. It is a custom product, so you're going to have to give yourself uh, some more lead time uh, situations when looking on custom products. And you know, if you've got 20 different style of parts, 
and you're going to have a different rack for all 20. Now you're going to be able to store all those as well. So storage can become a critical aspect. Um, just to point out here that the rack itself doesn't have to come down to the full opportunity window. We just we want the parts to be within that window. And the benefit of this custom design is that you have less material that's going to be coated that's not going into your finished product. So the legs here are gone. It, the, these legs are actually just long enough so that when that rack is set on the floor, you're not doing any damage to the hooks themselves. But there's less surface area in this rack, which allows for less waste of powder or paint during the application process. The modular style rack gives you a lot more flexibility. There's variety in sizes, different parts, different crossbars, uh, spacing between. Um, you've got shielded ground points to make sure, again, you've got good contact. In this case, you know, in a, in a uh, custom rack, if it's damaged, you, if, it, it may be more difficult to repair. Um, in this case, you might be looking at replacing a leg as part of the rack, or you might just be replacing crossbars. So it can give you a lot more flexibility. Typically, it's a standard part of a product, um, but it can use a combination of custom hooks in addition, depending on the part. Um, keeping in mind, again, do you clean this? Do you replace it? At what point? Um, and how do you store them? So just to kind of give an example here, here's a part with a fairly complex hang method, um, but it is being used on a crossbar. So that will go onto a rack, and, uh, and so there still can be a lot of creativity in the hanging solution to give good density when you're using a custom hook that's part of a standard rack. One of the other aspects now in terms of things that manufacturers are trying to accomplish is to um, minimize the number of touches that take place with a part. So for example here, what you have is a cart. It's got uh, uh, pegs here to support the actual custom rack. These crossbars can be removed and spaced as needed. You can see on the little sockets here on the side. So the spacing is adjustable. It gives a lot of flexibility. You can preload this and, and there are customers out there that will actually start with the, the rack itself in the welding area. And so those parts go right from welding into the rack itself, then transport it over to the coating, gets loaded onto the coating line, comes off the coating line back onto a rack, and gets moved to the assembly area. So not only have you got a way to improve density on your um, in the coating window, but you've minimized how many times that part is being handled through the whole overall manufacturing process. <coughs> Excuse me. So I mentioned uh, you know cleaning of hooks and racks. So um, there is chemical stripping out there, and there's there's a number of companies that offer that as a service, both in line. So it's actually you know the the hook and racks stay on your conveyor line and goes through the chemical stripping process. It can be an offline process. The benefit of that is strictly that you're not raising very high temperatures for cleaning. So the overall integrity of the hook or rack is going to be extended um, because you're not going through high temperatures. Um, Burn-off ovens, uh, the batch operations, they're typically operating around 800 degrees. There are some inline burn-off processes, but you're, you're looking at temperatures of 1500 degrees. And in that case, if that's your process, uh, you're going to be limited in the, the types of materials to that RA330 or Inconel. There are fluidized sand systems that um, do a very, very good job of cleaning and removing any residual ash from the system because on most burn-off processes there is an ash that's left on the hooks or racks and that needs to be cleaned off as part of the overall process. Um, some people have looked at blasting as a way to clean. Again, low temperature can be very effective. Uh, and then there's stripping services, so it can be a company to where you actually take those racks, take those hooks, you send them to an outside company that provides that stripping service for you. So I'm going to shift gears a little bit and talk uh, just briefly about line density. And um, the line density and line speeds are not mutually exclusive. So as John talked about, the um, uh, production number of pieces, and if you're running one shift or two or 24-7, um, 
typically what we will see in the field is companies say, you know what, we need to get more product through our system. We need to get higher productivity. And the, the answer to that is typically turning up the line speed. Um, the, the concern with that is how is that going to impact your overall process? So we want efficient production output, um, but we want to make sure that we're continuing to properly clean and cure these parts. So if your line's designed for 10 or 12 feet a minute and all of a sudden you're running it at 18 feet a minute, are those parts getting cleaned the way they were when it was 10 or 12? Are they getting cured properly? So you might start to be pushing the envelope and getting into a situation where um, you're not developing the kind of quality that, that you need coming off your line. Uh, with, with better density, you get improved first pass transfer efficiency, energy savings. I mean, it's, it's all good stuff if you can get better density on these parts through the coating process. So typically, um, pendant centers are 6, 8, or 12 inches. And just a, a quick example is a customer in northern Indiana that um, they, they have 6-inch spacing on their pendants. And when they're running their 14-inch part, they double hang it. Uh, they have a 4-inch gap. And with their inclines and declines, those parts do not hit during the process. The problem they have is occasionally they are running 15-inch parts. And they cannot stay on that same 18-inch spacing because those parts do hit. So now they've had to add and go to one more pendant spacing, and so now they have a 9-inch gap between parts. That's just open air. That is you know, not very efficient, not very dense. So the first approach, the most effective thing that you can look at, whether it's improving an existing line or looking and starting with a clean piece of paper, is having load bars. Instead of hanging off of pendants, you're hanging off of load bars. And there's a variety of different types of load bars that can be designed to accommodate whatever type style hooks or racks that you're using in your process. But it gives you, instead of spacing on 6, 8, 12, you know, 24 inches, <coughs> you might be on every 2 or 3 inches. and allows you to get much better um, spacing. I do suggest that if this is something and it's an existing line and you're looking at uh, improving your density, is that uh, take a 20-foot section of your conveyor and install the, uh, the load bars you're looking to use and you know, run them for a month. Make sure you're not creating a different problem. For example, if you have powder booths that are moving online and offline and your conveyor is just a couple of inches above the booth slot, you're not going to be able to fit a load bar in there and still be able to move the, uh, the booths online and offline. So you want to you wanna look at all areas of your process and make sure that the length is correct, you're not getting any uh, any binding as you go around the turns um, and that you have, you know, everything's going to work the way it should in, in design. So testing is always, 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 always a great way to go. So one of the areas why we look at line density is where we lose line density is because of elevation changes. And a lot of times, I mean, it's great if you can have a monorail system where your overhead conveyor is all at the same elevation. You can, you can put those racks within an inch or two of each other and, and go all day long, and it's a great situation. But in, the reality is, in most cases, you might be looking at 20 or 30 degree inclines and declines just simply because of the area of the plant where you're going, the type of equipment you're installing, the openings you have. There can be a lot of reasons where you need to have elevation changes. And it could be you're going from one load area and you need to get to uh, the coating zone is different because you've got a big power and free system. Well, you can't get around not having inclines and declines. But I just want to point out that, um, for example, if you have a 20 degree slope, the loss is about 6%, which in and of itself may not seem like a lot. Uh, but if, you're, if your value of your line, and I would encourage all of you to, uh, to make sure you know what the value of your finishing line is, um, and I'm going to use a very, very conservative number of saying $500 an hour. And, and to define what that is basically is ask yourself, okay, if my line goes down and I can't run parts for four hours, what am I losing? How much money am I losing between the people I'm paying, everything else that's going on, and the parts that aren't coming off, what's the value of my line? Well, at $500 uh, an hour, a 6% loss, which doesn't seem like a lot, adds up to about $60,000 a year. And that's, that's some real money. So... Um, it, is, it is important to try and either minimize the amount of slope 
um, or maybe take some different looks at it. Load bars, again, is a great way to help you get those parts as close as possible. There's also a technology called uh, angle pivot. And what takes place is during the uh, incline or decline, what happens is it actually, just gravity alone, kicks the, uh, the rack on a short, on a small angle off the center line. And it allows, the, it, it allows you to bring racks closer together without the racks hitting. So in a normal operation, if you've got a 20 or 30 degree incline, you might have 12, 15, 18 inches in between racks um, with an angle pivot type approach that allows you to bring those racks in much tighter. And so in the flat, you've got some really good line density going through your application process. Good first pass TE, really good way to improve productivity. So in summary, uh, I just encourage everyone to evaluate all of your options. Um, seek and look at first for standard solutions. And then, uh, and, and if you can't, you know, if that's not going to work for you, then seek creative solutions. And the engineers that are out there today can really come up with some creative ways to hang parts and present them to maximize your overall operation. Get the best line density you can. Any way you can accomplish that, it's, it does nothing but improve your overall efficiency of your process. And then always, again, ensure good ground from both a safety standpoint um, as well as from a performance standpoint. So I hope there was some valuable information there for you. Um, oh, last but not least, always operate safely. So with that, we want to thank you. Yes, thank you, John and Bruce. That was a very, very informative um, uh, presentation today. And uh, again, we just want to remind our, our um, uh, attendees that uh, we are going to be taking questions for them. If you'd like to uh, type those into your screen, you'll see that right there. Uh, should be on your screen. You can type questions. Also on the screen, you can see uh, email and contact information for our presenters. Uh, so you can absolutely give them a contact uh, or give them an email or a call if you'd like to. Uh, we do have some questions that did come in, so I'll go ahead and start with some of those. Uh, and, and by the way, if, uh, uh, if any questions that don't get answered, uh, our presenters will uh, circle back and contact you after the uh, 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 webinar today and, and get those answers to you. But uh, first question, I'm not sure which one of you would like to take this. It says, what would the time frame be for a custom hanging solution? Um, I'll take that. This is Bruce. So <coughs> um, ideally is, well, let me just give kind of a, a time frame of how that works. So uh, you've got a part that you need to get, uh, come up with a custom hanging solution for, and you submit drawings to a supplier. Uh, within a week or two, they should easily be able to provide you with a drawing, a concept um, that you would look at and evaluate and think, yeah, I think that might work. Um, before they actually build the first prototype, it's going to be a lot better if they actually have a sample part to work with. So if you can send a part with, a, with the drawings, that's going to be very good. Um, they will develop a prototype, and let's say, for example, ultimately you want to use stainless steel that prototype might be built out of just co-roll steel to help keep costs down um, because we're, what we're testing is functionality, not necessarily the, uh, the end product. Um, so that may take a week to get prototypes to you. Um, you sign off on it or you make some minor changes. So the, the design phase, you know, that, that could easily take anywhere from four to six weeks. And then now you have production time. And, you know, you might be looking at some large quantities, uh, that includes a lot of welding and the solution and so forth. So you could be looking at another six to eight weeks um, for overall getting total quantity through the uh, manufacturing process. So you on a custom solution, it could it could easily be you know two and a half to four months in the process. And I, I know it seems like a long time, um, but that's one of the reasons it's great if you can be looking at your hanging solution and hang methods. Uh, earlier than later in the process. Great. Uh, before we go to our next question, Bruce, you know, you might we might just want to mention because I've seen this happen. Uh, I know we're still a couple months away, but at, at Fabtech, uh, you're going to have everybody in the industry there, and I've seen um, a lot of um, companies bring their plans, and and there's a lot of people you could see at that show to help you with that. Uh, if you want to talk about that, that's coming up in November. That's a couple months away, but it's a good time to plan for that. No, I, I appreciate you saying that. Absolutely. So, 
Um, the Fab Tech Show is a phenomenal show. It's got everything basically starting from raw steel to, uh, to having a coated product. Uh, so you've got, you know, laser cutters out there, punches, shears, presses, um, but you've got the finishing industry well represented from everything from pretreatment chemicals to application equipment, systems designs, um, hooks and masking, uh, cleaning, stripping processes, and so it's, it's, it really does offer everything. And without question, if you have, you know, it's great for a guy to pull his phone out and say, hey, let me show you a picture of this part or here's the problem I'm having. Um, if it's if it's feasible to bring that part with you, it's going to be a lot more effective. Um, there's also great conferences that go on, and uh, and covering a lot of different uh, topics. And and one of the new ones this year, it's three concurrent uh, ses sessions that are about uh, adding finishing to a fabrication shop. So, you know, if you're even if you're an OEM or a metal bender right now, but you're thinking about adding a finishing system, it's it's similar to the three part webinar here. Um, going through the different aspects of the overall process and just making sure that everybody understands all the different factors that go into this and that we've addressed all the details. So, yeah, thank you for that in November in Las Vegas. Sure. Uh, we have another question. The uh, question is, uh, what if I am designing for multiple metals? I'll take that one, Sam, John Sudges. Um, a lot of times people are uh, either producing with or their products are made out of cold rolled steel uh, and or aluminum, so they need to design the system to handle both. Uh, it really comes down to as as this series progresses to say the next step, uh, it comes down to pretreatment. You have to have uh, the proper pretreatment, whether it's an automated system or whether it's a batch system, we have to accom accommodate potentially multi-metals going through there. That, that, that is a great question. Uh, so that way there is chemistry out there that can can uh, pre-treat and clean multiple metals and you can run it in one system. Okay, great, great. Uh, uh, next question, next how, do I, how do I know when I should replace, I should replace, my, replace my hooks? Replace your hooks. Um, you know, how often should you replace your hooks? I, I, I'd like to be able to say, you know, every every ten times that it goes through that, you know, you need to replace them. But there there is no hard and fast rule because Every type of coating that's being, um, how much of the hook is being exposed, the hang points themselves, um, you know, ideally is that you're not going to lose ground. And, and ground, basically, to have a good ground, you you want uh, you don't want to have it exceed one mega ohm. Um, you don't want your conductivity to exceed mega ohm. So if you can have a a gauge to do testing on the uh, hook itself, and just make sure that the part that's hanging on there has good ground. You can continue to run. I know one of the uh, chemical suppliers that does stripping uh, did a very extensive test on how many times the hook would go through and when did they start to lose ground. And uh, it was interesting. It was actually quicker than what I would have thought. Uh, it was three or four times around. It was starting to lose ground. And it was interesting, if you, especially on a powder system, if you lose ground, um, it's not that you don't coat the part. You just coat it very inconsistently. You have wide ranges in film thickness from you know maybe 1.2 mil up to 4.8 mil so it's just it's just a very uh, interesting phenomena that losing ground um, just gives you very inconsistent coverage and so forth so yeah, unfortunately it's going to be more of a learning process uh, as you get used to your system on how frequently you need to be doing that okay great I, uh, John I think this might be a question for you why why does weight matter well, as Bruce, as, as Bruce described during the, uh, the hanging considerations, well, everything we need to know is, well, you know, how we're going to process that part. Um, so for rack design, hook design, even if you're, gonna, if you're doing it on a, on a cart, we may have to make sure that the cart is stable enough to handle the heaviest part. Uh, or vice versa, if it's on an overhead conveyor, there's different styles of overhead conveyor that can handle different weight capacity. Very good question. Okay. Uh, let me follow up. I think this is also directed to you. What do you mean by the process? Well, the process is what I, what I mean is you know, there are several factors within the process. Pre-treatment, you have to have the substrate clean. Uh, application equipment, you know, whether it's liquid and or if it's powdered. Yeah. And then, uh, obviously, the ovens, whether we're drying off the parts or whether we're curing the parts. And then, 
again, the uh, material handling to interface with each one of the pieces of equipment. I kind of summarize those items as the process. Okay. I think we have uh, time for one more question, and uh, I guess first this might go to you. What, what do you think is the best method for cleaning hooks and racks? Well, I, I, if, it was, if it was my line and uh, in my opportunity, I mean, I, uh, burn off is by far and away the most common method, probably the most abrasive on uh, the life of the hooks and racks. So um, depending on, you know, the area of the country you are and what kind of restrictions you may or may not have. Um, personally, I'd probably look at chemical stripping first, and if that was not an option, then uh, then I would look at the burn-off. Great. Okay. Well, listen, I think we're getting to close to the top of, our, of the hour. We again want to thank the, the people uh, who sponsored today's uh, webinar for you, Engineered Finishing Solutions, Thermotronics, uh, and Fostoria Industries, and we want to thank John and Bruce did a great job today with our presentation and also for uh, CCAI for helping put this together. Thank you guys very much. Um, and as again, as a reminder, there is a part two and a part three that's going to be coming up of this uh, series. Uh, part two will be September 8th at 2 p.m. and we'll focus on the pretreatment aspect. Uh, part three will be held on November 3rd also at 2 p.m., and it's going to focus on drying and curing. And if you'd like more information, you can go to ccaiweb.com website and also the pfonline.com website. You get more information. You can register for that. Uh, again, John Bruce, thank you very much uh, for your uh, great information today. And thank we you. want to, yes, thank you very much. And we want to thank everyone for joining us. Have a great afternoon.